Okay, picking up with where we left off the other day, which should be on 1322, Act 5, Scene 1, um, around 157. The grave diggers are digging a grave for Ophelia. One of them, I think it's Clown 1, as he's called, you know, is in the grave and keeps throwing up. He's thrown up, I think now, three skulls. And he tells Hamlet that the last one is of a man named Yorick. And Hamlet says, Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. Fancy means imagination. He has borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises in it. And he's talking about my memories of riding on Yorick's back while holding his skull. Okay? When, how old was he when Yorick carried him, on, carried him on his back? Or how old was he when Yorick died? Seven years old. So he remembers probably from his earliest memories and to that point. Why does his gorge, that's his, his stomach, rise into his throat? He's holding the skull, okay? He's thinking of his own youth and Yorick's essential youth then. Hamlet's being reminded of something more than just riding on Yorick's back in Yorick's joke telling. This is emblematic of what's called memento mori. Remembrance of death, okay? It's a common trope in the Renaissance. You see actual images of this everywhere in portraiture. You'll see someone, uh, the most famous one is probably of the um, Dutch philosopher Erasmus, who's portrayed in all of his glory, all of his intellectual glory, his youth, all that kind of stuff. And he's got his hand, if, if I'm remembering correctly, he's got his hand on a skull, emphasizing this youth, this vitality, is going to end up like this. You can't escape death. Okay? So, Hamlet goes on. Here hung those lips that I've kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes, your jokes, now, your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning. Quite chap fallen, lips gone. That's what the chaps refers to. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her. Who's this lady? Could mean Gertrude. It could mean any lady. Okay. And tell her. Let her paint an inch thick. An inch thick of makeup. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Prithee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's Hamlet just told us? Again, it's this. Everyone dies. What did he say when he talked about Polonius? And Polonius' death with the king and such. What did he say was the purpose of Polonius? Or the purpose of life? We fat to die. We fat animals to fatten ourselves to do what? To fatten the maggots. And then he goes on and talks about how worms can eat through the body of a king or emperor. You go fishing, you catch that worm, you catch the fish, you eat the fish. You eat the emperor slash king, and it goes through you. All to what end? To feed the worms. Hamlet asks Horatio, Dost thou think Alexander looked of this fashion in the earth? Do you think this is what Alexander the Great looked like when he was dead? Yeah. It smelled so. Now, the, the skull itself isn't what smells, because York's been dead for 23 years. There's no flesh on it, just raw, bare bone. 
doesn't stink, okay? But there's been more recent graves dug up here, too. This is telling us, okay, when, when the skull, when the grave digger throws up the, the first skull, that's the most recent grave. And then he digs up another one beneath that. Why? He's getting down deep enough for the new internment, this time, internment, I should say, Ophelia. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? What does Hamlet mean by the word base? It has multiple meanings. It's primary, it's main one. If we were on the first floor or outside, foundational, the ground, literally earth uses. Why? Because that's where metaphorically we come from, or from the book of Genesis, you know, from dust thou art, to dust shalt thou return. So to what base uses we may return. But base also means lowly. Vulgar, dirty, if you want. Okay. Why may not imagination, fancy, the word that he used to describe Yorick earlier, why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till I find it stopping a bunghole? Okay. Trace. It's the idea that he implied earlier in talking about Polonius's guts, worms, fish, etc. So let's trace Alexander, who lived, conquered the known world, okay? Trace his dust, follow it, until we see it, he says, become a cork in a bunghole. A bunghole is the hole in a cask of beer or wine, etc that you put a spigot into to pour. Why cannot we iman, imagine the greatest emperor the world has seen being put to the use of stopping a hole in a cask of beer? Twere to consider too curiously. In other words, Hamlet, don't go there. Why? What does that reduce humanity to? No, no. Faith, not a jot. In other words, no, I am going to go there. Let's follow him. But to follow him thither with modesty enough in likelihood to lead it, as thus. Alexander died. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth unto dust. The dust is earth. Of earth we make loam, clay. And why of that loam whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? In other words, it isn't too curious and by curious, it means too deep to look in. It's not too deep. It's pretty simple, actually. Imperius Caesar, dead, turned to clay. Might stop a hole to keep the wind away. That is, a hole, if this were a log building, between these layers of concrete block, you would have what's called chinking. That's the mortar that goes between the logs. I lived in a log cabin when Tennessee had its coldest record uh, coldest weather on record back in January of 1985. I was on Lookout Mountain. It didn't get above zero for three days on Lookout Mountain. That log cabin, you could see daylight between some of the logs because the chinking had fallen out. He's saying Caesar could be, you know, pick up some dirt, wet it, turn it into mud, stop that hole, keep the cold from coming in. Oh, that that earth, that earth is what? Caesar. Oh, that that earth, which kept the world in awe, should patch a wall to expel the winter's flaw. Shakespeare had already written his Julius Caesar play, by the way. Okay? But so, here comes the king. And he sees the king and Gertrude in Laertes and other attendants. The queen, the courtiers, who is this they follow? And with such maimed rights. Maimed. Hamlet knows that this is a funeral procession. 
But he says the rights are maimed. What does to maim something mean? To injure it, to damage it. The rights aren't complete. He can tell from his vantage point. The priest isn't saying all the prayers that ought to be said as they're making their way to the grave. <clears throat> this death betoken, the coarse body, corpse, they follow, did with desperate hand for do its own life. That is, the prayers I see, the actions I see of the priest are telling me the body in that casket, or maybe just burial shroud, that body committed suicide. And that's why there aren't all these other prayers. Twas of some estate, that is, but that's not a low-born person. How do you know? One dead giveaway, king and queen are in attendance. All right? Let's, let's sit here a while. Couch we, that is, let's hide. All right? And Hamlet's, wait, that's Laertes, a very noble youth. Hamlet respects Laertes. Okay. Laertes asks, what ceremony else, that is, what other, what more ritual is there to do? Priest, her obsequies, that is, our prayers for her, have been as far enlarged as we have warranty, as we have law. He's talking about canon law, church law. We can't do or say any more than we've done. Her death was doubtful. <laughs> He's saying, the coroner didn't say this was a holy death. The coroner said, I can't determine what the cause was. The coroner does determine she died by drowning. Why did she die by drowning? That's the part that's unsure. And but that great command oversways the order she should in ground unsanctified have lodged till the last trumpet. What is that great command that oversways the order? The king. The king commanded she gets buried in hallowed ground in the churchyard. That's what, that's the oversweighing the order because what should the order have been? That she should in ground unsanctified, unhallowed, outside the church property have been buried. Till what? Till the last trumpet. That is, day of resurrection. For charitable prayers, shards, flints, and pebbles should be thrown on her. That is, instead of charitable prayers. Charitable meaning divine love. Prayers raising her to God's divine mercy. He says, instead of that, what should Ophelia be getting? Shards, flints, and pebbles should be thrown at her. Why? Because the priest is saying, she killed herself. And that, Catholic Church, is the unforgivable sin. You can't be repentant for that. Because you're, you're saying, just before you kill yourself, whether it's knife, drowning, etc., just before that act, you're saying, my problem is so large, not even God can resolve it. And if you're saying not even God can resolve it, that's blasphemy. Okay? Yet here she has allowed her virgin crants, that is prayers for her, her maiden instruments in the bringing home of bell and burial. Bell, probably an incenser. So she's actually, her coffin is being sensed with incense. Laertes, no more? No more. We should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem and such rest to her as to peace parted souls. That is, we would make a profanity of proper burial to people who died accidentally 
or people who died, quote unquote, in grace, if we were to do any more for her, and what it means is we would make a mockery of the church's holy services, okay? Lay her in the earth, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violet spring. I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. He's essentially just damned the priest. All right? Hamlet. What? The ferrophilia? But notice, it's not a question, it's an exclamation. He's shocked. Queen scatters flowers. And look at what she says. Okay? I think this harkens back to what the queen tells Ophelia just before Act 3, Scene 1, when the queen tells Ophelia, we hope you can bring Hamlet back to himself and maybe honors can be done to him and to you. I hoped thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. Again, I've said multiple times, Ophelia is not royal. Ideally, she wouldn't become Hamlet's wife. But Gertrude is telling us here, she didn't have a problem with that. Who did? Or who said there might be problems? Polonius and Laertes. Why? They said, Hamlet is out of your sphere. <laughs> He's out of your reach. Gertrude just said, no, he wasn't. I wanted you to marry him. The, you know, in one sense, that's the tragedy. Hamlet, in the, on the next page, is going to tell us he loved Ophelia more than 40,000 brothers. Obviously not brotherly love, also. I hope thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. I thought thy bread, thy bride bed to have decked. That is, I'd hoped that I and my ladies might have been able to go and decorate the bridal bower and not have strewed thy grave. It is another kind of bridal bed. It's the bridal bed of death. Laertes, O oh, treble woe, fall ten times treble on that cursed head, whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. Notice, what is he saying caused Ophelia's death? The wicked deed that deprived her of her sense. What deed? What assumption is he making? The death of Polonius is what caused her to go crazy or is what caused her to die. Okay? Possibly, at the very least, it compounded the problem because I think the problem began earlier. It began much earlier. It began when Polonius said, make yourself more scarce around Hamlet. And then when she returned the letters and such to Hamlet, see, it's only after she returns those letters in that scene after the to be or not to be speech, which is the same scene, it's only when she returns, after she returns those letters that Hamlet's conversation with her really turns. That is that Hamlet kind of like goes, And he starts playing with her mind, getting to a nunnery, you know, all that kind of stuff. Hamlet advances, that is, he comes out of hiding. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? Whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. Now remember what his letter to the king said that was delivered the previous day? I stand naked on your shore, 
Okay? And I'm going to meet with you tomorrow. You can't be more naked than this. I mean, physically, yes, he can strip off his clothes, but he's what? He's standing at the side of a grave. Is he armed? No, he's not. He has nothing with him. Laertes, the devil take thy soul. Okay? Hamlet, after Laertes leaps in the grave in his speech, Hamlet leaps into the grave too. Okay? Why? It's like you're competing as to who loved Ophelia the more. The devil take thy soul. And he grabs Hamlet around the throat. Hamlet, thou prayest not well. It's not the kind of thing you're supposed to pray for. You're supposed to pray for God to be merciful to your enemy within a Christian context. Okay, That's one of the things that makes this a different kind of revenge tragedy. You know, your introduction talked about Seneca, ancient Roman author, talked about Thomas Kidd, uh, British, English author, just slightly before Shakespeare, alive when Shakespeare was alive and such. Shakespeare probably saw his plays. But kids, Spanish tragedy, and Seneca stuff, it's not Christian. Shakespeare takes that revenge tragedy and drops it into a Christian society. And is like, okay, so how's a Christian supposed to deal with this? So, Laertes, the devil take your soul. Hamlet, well, that's not a generous Christian. Prayer. I pray thee take thy fingers from my throat, which is telling us again stage direction. He should be throttling Hamlet. For though I am not splenative and rash, splenative, quick tempered, how do we know he's not quick tempered? Because we're in Act 5 and he still hasn't killed Claudius. He's had opportunity, he's had means, he definitely has motive. Yet I have in me something dangerous which let thy wisdom fear. What is it that he has in him that is something dangerous? Go back to his opening speech with his mother. I have that which in which surpasseth all outward show. And he repeatedly says, down, down breaking heart. In other words, you push Hamlet too far, and what's going to happen? He's going to go all Abner Snopes on you. He's going to just snap. Okay? So they separate Hamlet from Laertes. And Hamlet says, I will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag. And what he kind of means by that is, I mean, you've got a gloss. 235, move. Yes, that's what it means on a literal level. He means, I will fight with him to the death on this theme. Queen, what theme? I loved Ophelia. Who was the first one to tell Hamlet, excuse me, to tell Ophelia, Hamlet doesn't love He was the first one to poison her mind. And what is Hamlet telling us? Now, some readers, some directors, some actors, etc., some critics say, not true. Hamlet's saying he loved Ophelia, but he didn't really love Ophelia. In other words, they're kind of of the camp of Laertes and Polonius. It's, to me... It's just dishonest. <laughs> That's not taking what the text says at face value. This is before you get what's called in literary circles an unreliable narrator. That is where, with an unreliable narrator, the person narrating the story might be lying to us because the person narrating the story is part of the story. The most famous example is Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, where Bartleby works for a lawyer, and the lawyer is the narrator. And the lawyer doesn't treat Bartleby very kindly.
kind. And so the lawyer lies. We get those lies from his voice. So you have to, wait, is that true? <laughs> because Barnaby says things that kind of make you go, wait, there's a problem here. Which one's telling the truth? You don't have that, okay? That idea of the unreliable narrator in Shakespeare's day. So, I loved Ophelia. 40,000 brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. What wilt thou do for her? Laertes, what will you do? And the wilt could also be, what would you have done for her? King, he's crazy, Laertes. Kind of back away. Queen, forbear him. That is, suffer him. Endure. Don't kill him. Hamlet. Swoons. By God's wounds. Show me what they'll do. Okay, now that is present tense. Show me what you will do. Will you weep? Will you fight? Will you fast? Will you tear yourself? Will you drink up ISIL? Eat a crocodile? What? <laughs> I'll do it all. Whatever you'll do, I see that and I raise it. Dost thou come here to whine? To outface me with leaping in her grave? Be buried quick with her and so will I. And if thou pray to mountains, let them throw millions of acres on us till our ground, singeing his pain against the burning zone, make Asa like a ward. Nay, and thou wilt melt. I'll rent. Come on, Laertes. What will you do? I'll, I'll do the same. The queen. He's crazy. This fit's going to stay on him a while. Why does she think he's crazy? Because of this? What was the queen's last real interaction with Hamlet? <clears throat> and what happened in that scene? Oh, you're, you're here because I'm trying? I know, I'll get to it. And she's like, Hamlet? Who are you talking to? What do you see? Him! My father! Hamlet? There's nobody there. He, you don't see him? Hamlet, you're freaking crazy. He's like, take my pulse. Calm, 60 beats a minute. <laughs> Are my eyes rolling in my head? He's crazy, okay? Hamlet. In one sense, he's responding to Gertrude's, Gertrude's words, but he's not responding. He shouldn't be looking at her. He turns to Laertes. Hear you, sir. What is the reason that you use me thus? Why are you attacking me? <laughs> what have I done to you? I loved you ever. That is, Laertes, we always got along. That's what that means. We were always friends. But it is no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may. The cat will mew and dog will have his day. In other words, nature will take its course. King says, Rachel, wait, wait upon him, that is. Get him some good alcohol, calm him down, you know. Scene two. Hamlet and Horatio enter. And Hamlet says, so much for this, sir. They enter talking. So much for this means, let's stop talking about that. He said, now you're going to see the other what. It's going to come out. The other reasons why I'm here, how I'm here, etc. So he says, you remember, you know, the other things? Talks about the mutinies and the bilbos. That is the uprising on the boat that, you know, he was on with the pirates and all that kind of stuff. And then he says, line five, six, seven, eight. Our indiscretion sometimes serves us well. Indiscretion. Lack of thinking things out. What is one of Polonius' piece of advice to his son? 
Never give action to an unproportioned thought. That is, to a thought that you haven't logically thought through to its consequences. Well, that's indiscretion. It's not thinking properly about something. Our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots do pall. And by pall, it means stall. They, they don't go any farther. And that should learn us, teach us. There is a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. All right. What's he mean by that? There's a divinity that shapes our ends. That word, I've used it multiple times this semester. Two meanings. Ends, purposes, our intentions, or the intentions for why we exist, as well as ends, the end of our life, the final act, so to speak. He says there's a divinity that shapes that from beginning to end. And what do we do between that? We rough hew our end. What does it mean to rough hew? To hew means to re refers to to work with an axe or what's called a draw knife. To take a log and to trim the bark off that log and then to shape that log from being round to being square. Okay? So they can be used for building something. He says, we rough hew that log. That log is our lives. We rough hew that. But there's a divinity that does what? It shapes it. Why? So that it can become part of something more. The idea that we are totally independent, self-contained, is totally foreign to this idea. According to this idea, we're all part of a puzzle. And we each fit into that puzzle. And we each have a very unique purpose for that puzzle, so to speak. Okay? And if we don't fit into it, then the puzzle ultimately is left what? Incomplete. So Hamlet says, we try to shape our lives. How do we do that? We make decisions. We take actions. Sometimes we do that indiscreetly. <laughs> we don't think properly. Whatever you think about it, the deed is done, something has happened. The two Democrats who were expelled from the Tennessee legislature last night, okay? Why did it happen? You, we could go into all the politics. That's not what I'm interested in. It happened because they, quote, unquote, broke the rules of the House. They both used a bullhorn. That's against the rules of the House. They took control of the well. That's against the rules of the House indiscreet action. Probably, if they had realized when they did that, March 30th, what would happen last night, they probably wouldn't have done it. My guess. Maybe they would have. Okay, But that was the indiscreet action. The divinity is kind of, you know, making that fit into something. So, and notice, he says, you know, the indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots do pall. That is, the indiscretion, the rash action, when our great conspiring plots just fall apart. We just respond. And that, that's what teaches us. We go about our lives trying to do things, but there's another power at work, to use the language that J.R.R. Tolkien uses in The Lord of the Rings. Horatio, well, that's most certain. In other words, we don't understand how all of our actions lead to this point in our lives because we don't see everything else that happened to get us to that point. So, Hamlet talks about what he did with the letters that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern had. And in fact, he pulls it out. He pulls out the original and says, here, read it. We don't read what it actually says, but we're told what it said. 
Okay. Horatio asks, in response, how was the letter that you wrote sealed? In other words, how would the king of, king of England know that it's the real letter? Because kings and queens have royal seals that indicate this is from me. And Hamlet says, oh yeah, well, I just happen to have with me my father's signet ring. I used to wear, I broke it, a ring that was my grandfather's, and it has an image on the front of a Roman knight or a medieval knight, possibly. Okay? That could be used if you wanted to. It could be used to fold a piece of paper, write in it, fold it like this, okay? drop wax on it, hold the ring there for a moment, take it off, and it has the imprint of that Roman head or that knight's head. Hamlet says, I have my father's ring. Not the same as the full official kingly or monarchical seal, because those are usually huge, all right? But enough to be recognized as king of Denmark, okay? Horatio. So Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. <laughs> Hamlet, they made love to this employment. They wanted this job so badly. They are not near my conscience. I don't feel any guilt at all for what happens to them. Why? Tis dangerous when the baser nature comes between the past and fell incensed points of mighty opposites. The language Shakespeare has just used, Hamlet has just used, is the language of fencing. The points, the points of the foils. This is what happens when non-great people get involved in the plots of great ones. They get chewed up and spat out. It doesn't matter what happens to them. Okay? Horatio, what a king is this? I can't believe he would do that. Does it not think they stand me now upon? So Hamlet kind of says, look, look at my case now. He, the king, hath killed my king, whored my mother. It's the first time he uses the word whore. Whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, that is, the election of the king's advisors and Hamlet's hopes to be king, thrown out his angle, fishing metaphor, for my proper life, and with such cousinage, trickery. Is it not perfect conscience to quick him, <laughs> kill him, with this arm? Don't I have every right? He's asking Horatio. And is it not to be damned? Now that's, you know, a statement. Don't I have a right to do this and not be damned by it? Or, and I'll still be damned. It could be either of those. And is it, but that statement isn't over. And is it not to be damned? To let this canker of our nature come in further evil? That is, wouldn't I be damned if I didn't stop Claudius from doing even more? There's a whole Christian tradition, especially in the just war theory tradition, that you can involve yourself, you can be involved in a war, you can actually start a war as long as it is to stop another power from perpetrating an even greater evil than it's already doing. Okay? This theory can also be drawn down to an individual. 
that an individual can take an action to stop another individual from doing what? A great atrocity. For example, Second World War, German Lutheran theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer joined with some other people in attempting to kill Hitler. Bonhoeffer said, it is more right to kill Hitler than to let him continue living. And it is more merciful. I don't know that he said this. C.S. Lewis said this in his little essay, Why I Am Not a Pacifist. It is more merciful to him to stop him from killing more people. Why? The more and more people someone kills, the more and more responsibility one has. So if someone kills 20 people, but plans to kill a whole lot more, and you stop that person, that person doesn't have all those other deaths on his head. Okay? That's all part, it's tied into this just war kind of theory. Horatio, you know he knows. It, he's going to find out how you were returned from England. That is, the king's going to find out what happened to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Why? Because word's going to come from England that says, I've done your bidding, O Lord, <laughs> O King. I killed those two men. Hamlet, it will be short. It's, it's going to happen soon. The interim is mine. What does interim mean? Literally, the between time. What did Hamlet say after he saw the ghost? The time is out of joint. A wicked spite that I was born to make it right. Okay? The interim, that in between time, Hamlet says, mine. And a man's life's no more than to say, one. What? Hamlet is extrapolating. He's saying, in terms of the grand scheme of thing, things, our life, it's like a blink of the eye. Go back to the Old Testament, go to the New Testament. Human life is like what? A flower. It blooms, the sun shines, the sun beats, and it's dead, it's gone. Our lives are like grass. It grows and withers away. Boom, gone. Okay? But he says, I am sorry for Horatio. Why? For by the image of my cause, the reflection of my cause, what's Hamlet's cause? The king killed my father. The image of that, the reflection of that, he says, I see Horatio's, I, I see Laertes. Why? Because I killed his father. I'll court his favors. I'll try to make it up. Really? How do you make up for that? How do you make up for having killed someone's father, even if it was accidental? Which, it wasn't accidental. He just hoped it was Claudius, okay? So, Osric comes in. And Osric says, the king and Laertes have kind of challenged you to a game. And the king's betting on you to win. Horatio's like, don't do it, don't do it. You'll lose. <laughs> Everybody knows how good Laertes is. Hamlet, I don't think I'll lose. Top of 1330. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. That is, the bets makers are going to take odds that Laertes will win. The odds are going to be like five to one. If Hamlet, you know, five to one that Laertes wins, three strikes to one, something like that. If Hamlet wins in any way, he beats the odds. That way he wins, okay? But that one's not thinking how ill 
Thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. It's no matter. What has Hamlet just told us? Got a bad feeling about this. Something's not right. Okay. The king in Laertes, hmm. he doesn't say it, but something makes, something's funny. Nay, good, my lord, eh, don't worry, but just foolery, such a kind of gang giving as would perhaps trouble a woman. In other words, it's butterflies. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forest forestall their repair hither. Say you're not fit. What does he mean, if your mind dislike anything, obey it? We would say today, that's not the kind of phrase we would say. We would say what? Follow your gut. If your gut says, mm, don't go through with it, probably should do that. Hamlet, not a whit. No, I'm not going to back out. We defy augury, augury, fortune telling. Divination, trying to peer into the future. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Why? Because Jesus says in the Gospels, your heavenly father knows when a sparrow falls. He has every hair on your head counted. You don't think he's aware of when people die? It's every, the implication is everything falls under God's control. Okay? Special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, what's the it? Okay, literally, it might be referring back to the previous sentence, the fall of a sparrow. If the sparrow is supposed to fall, now it'll fall. And it's not going to fall tomorrow. Fall meaning just meaning die. If it be not to come, if the sparrow isn't supposed to die tomorrow, it'll die today. If it be not now, yet it will come. What's really the it? My death. If my death isn't now, it's to come. If it's not to come, it'll be now. If it's not now, yet it will come. Why? We all die. Boom. Memento mori. The readiness is all. What does Hamlet mean? What must Hamlet say implies? What must we be prepared for? Every moment of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year. Death. Now that sounds kind of morbid, but it's not when you look around the world. I mean, Nashville, last week. Okay, nine-year-olds don't think about this at all, but 60-year-olds do. And the teacher, the administrator, and the chef slash custodian, whichever he was, they all probably at one point in the last year or so thought about death because they've known people who have died from natural causes or whatever. Okay, The older and older you get, what? The closer and closer to the grave you get. We think. Is that necessarily true? No. Because death can be literally right outside that door. There could be a former student right now, maybe not mine, but somebody else's, who's walking the halls with a gun. It happens every freaking year at a university campus. That's Hamlet's point. Every moment, one must be ready to die. It's, by the way, when I teach my Harry Potter and, and Tolkien course, it's what the entire Harry Potter series is about. The, the How to learn to die well, meaning to be prepared, no matter what. The readiness is all. Since no man of aught he leaves knows, no man knows anything of what he leaves, not of what he leaves. When? Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh 
would thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the Almighty had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. God, take me now, or, you know, let me kill myself, and then to me, or not to me. But the thought of what dreams may come does what? It sicklies over the pale, the, the native hue of resolution and such. Let be. Cue the Beatles. <laughs> let it be. Let Listen to the song, by the way. It's kind of like, let whatever come can you stop it from happening? No. That's the whole message of the Oedipus cycle. Oedipus tries to stop his death. And in trying to stop it, or excuse me, tries to stop his destiny. In trying to stop it, he brings it about. There's the divinity that shapes our wills, rough hew them as we will. Oedipus rough hews it. He puts all the pieces in place. The divinity knocks the dominoes down. Okay? So, everybody gathers in a new room. I thought we would finish today, but we're obviously not. And the king says, Hamlet, come, take this hand from me. And he strides forward with Laertes and holds Laertes' arm out, and Hamlet shakes Laertes' hand. Why? What is that supposed to be? Is this, you know, two boxers before a match touching fists? Because those two boxers don't love each other. They're not going to be nice to each other. They're going to beat the living daylights out of each other. This is make amends. Okay? Hamlet, give me your pardon, sir. I have done you wrong. Compare that with a modern quote-unquote celebrity or political apology. Notice what Hamlet says. He doesn't say, I'm sorry that you feel offended. He says, I have wronged you. I, my agency, I did it. It was wrong. You were the one who received the wrong. That is a true apology. But pardon it, forgive it, as you are a gentleman. Gentlemen, when someone asks for forgiveness, should give it. We'll stop there. We can't go on. Um, so we will finish. What's today? Today's Friday. We will finish on Monday. I'll go ahead and put up a quiz over Acts 4 and 5. Probably won't make it due until Monday night. And then the end of next week, I will have a exam up over drama. So the two Oedipus plays, the two Shakespeare plays, the background information for both of those. I will send out a revised reading list for the poems for the rest of the semester. Um, go ahead and for Monday also, just read over those terms under the reading poetry. We won't go over them in class, because most of them, we've, many of them we've already talked about with the other two genres. All right, have a good weekend.